I've got a uh, residency space <coughs> here at the mill for the next six months. I'm, I guess, a hybrid artist that does like uh, video performance, painting, and I guess writing. And I also come from a film and TV background. And my works usually explore things like identity, um, disability, chronic illness, and mental health. And I'm doing a show called Sick Bitch here at the mill as well for the fringe, which is, I guess, exploring things like endometriosis, ADHD, and mental illness. And yeah, I just would love to create works that help enact change. Hey, I'm Denise. My pronouns are she, her. I'm an Australian-born Filipino person, and um, I'm a community organizer. So I guess my craft, my art is bringing communities together and help nurture the soil before we plant the seed. I feel like so many artist practices, so many community practices look at the individual who's leading that. I'm more interested in creating the safety net around that so that person can thrive. Um, and that's why it brought me to the Solidarity Collective, but I also was a director of the Drop-In Care Space, which is a uh, peer-run community centre um, in the city. Uh, for neurodivergent people, queer people, uh, disabled people, um, and yeah, kind of just bringing all of that together to create authentic community and allow people to show up authentically um, without the precursors or the, you know, capital S solidarity or the, um, yeah, expectations and just people coming and being themselves. Yeah. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Ellis. Um, she, they, or anything you like, I don't actually, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I work with contemporary art a lot. I work predominantly with ceramic, glass, installation, and a bit of illustration painting, pretty much whatever medium that suits my idea. And um, I'm also a tattoo artist working just right in there, so if anyone wants a tattoo. <laughs> um, my work is mostly inspired by um, a multicultural. Uh, my multicultural background, because I was born in China, but I came here very young, so the different, like, experiencing two completely different cultures has a really big impact on my aesthetic and my practice. So um, that and acculturation is always one of the major topics of any work that I create, and I wish my work eventually brings people more is um, <sighs> Running out of words, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> 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 brings a bit more inspiration or, like, um, give ideas to anyone who sort of had similar situation as me or just like stumble across like having to having to sort of shove themselves into fitting the environment to feel a bit more nourished. Yeah. Is that the word for it? But mm -hmm. yeah, that was the major idea behind the words. Yeah. Alright, thank you. Um, I have a few kind of prompts that I kind of thought would be good to like start off some conversation and like pose I guess um because I feel like this is going to be like a mini solidarity meeting for us um because <laughs> these are the kind of things that um we talk about kind of every couple of weeks um so I guess maybe I'll start over here um I feel like this one might be a good one to pose to Denise um and then see where we go from there. Um, but I think we've kind of talked a lot about um, how there is, thankfully now, a lot of like um, opportunities like um, uh, the studio here at the mill that Yasmin and I and Beret, who has also been in this opportunity, have been able to access and a lot of other opportunities for people of colour within um, I guess the greater creative industry in Adelaide but I feel like we often talk about how when these opportunities are presented and our urge to show up as our authentic self that can some kind, sometimes have a bit of a disconnect um, so I think uh, I guess the question is um, uh, like how have you how have you found it trying to rock up authentically um, and also like what kind of safety nets around these opportunities do you think there should be for people?
people of color? Yeah, good question. Um, I think that when you realize you're missing community and you want to find it, it's kind of like dating or it's kind of like meeting a new friend or starting a new course or something where it's like you have to dip your toe in and see what it is before committing to it, but you can't put all eggs in one basket because um, I'm sure we've all been to spaces that scream out, you know, queer friendly or POC friendly or just like accessible for disabled people and you get there and it's like, nah. It, <laughs> or it's like, yeah, it's like, okay, you're telling me that, but who consulted that? Um, so I think with the Solidarity Collective, it was an awesome coming together of people, but it also wasn't my first time trying to find my people. Um, I've worked in a lot of progressive not-for-profits in the past, and you know, there's this really well-known graphic amongst people of colour where it's like, you, you enter this progressive place, you go through the honeymoon period, um, you start to pull up stuff that you see is not great, and then you get vilified because you're the person bringing it up rather than the person shining the light on the issue. And unfortunately for us, that's just something we have to go through until we find our people. Because those people who have experienced that will see that, but those who haven't don't realise they're perpetuating it. And they think they're the first person ever to ever perpetuate it harm. So I guess when going into these new spaces, um, if, if we're going like admin angle, I would, every time I see a new progressive space, I always check their board, check their um, leadership team, check their staff. If I'm going off vibe, then it's more just like, you know, I'm 31, so I feel like I've learned to, I've learned what my boundaries are, but it's just that thing of being vulnerable, but trying not to trauma dump, because that's not good for anyone, you know? Um, so there's your own protections that you need to know of yourself and tune into yourself, but then there's also like practical things you can do, like simply looking up the leadership team, the board, the staff who get paid, who even who gets full time. Um, if if they're not working with people of colour, then they don't know how to work with people of colour, especially at a leadership um, level, because if you don't know how to disagree with a person of colour without making it fall apart. If you don't know how to hear someone else's perspective and like diversity is more than um, cultural diversity. Diversity can be diversity of experience, diversity of education. If everyone on that board has a PhD but nobody's talking from lived experience, what's going on there? Mm -hmm. um, just sort of those sort of things, I guess. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> no, that's really good. Cool. I think that sounds great. I, um, does anyone else have anything to say about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think in terms of showing up as your authentic self yeah. in certain spaces, there's a huge amount of vulnerability on our part involved in that. Right. Because we always go in with the best intentions and that optimism that we have to retain in order, in order to survive in white society, essentially, because we don't what we do. And that vulnerability exposes us, makes us in essence, and the disappointment that we often face is really, really hard to navigate. And just drawing on what Denise said, progressive spaces tend to be worse to the point that I'm really looking back to going into full corporate spaces now because I find in progressive spaces um, there's some cognitive dissonance. We get people that are best intent on doing the right thing, have position so much of their identity in I am progressive, I am the all seeing all hearing, of course that would never harm. So that when you say, hey, this isn't okay, it's not like saying, oh, this part of your organisation isn't functioning well because of this. It's literally like you have held a mirror up, got a dagger and stabbed it in their heart, and the uh, ferocity that you face when you call that is like nothing else. And so for me, a, a term that I've heard used quite a lot lately, is like the, uh, what is it, the non-for-profit industrial complex, which yeah, encompasses exactly. a lot of art spaces too, and um, it just makes them very, very dangerous for us to navigate and exist in, because if we call out problems or try and see change making, 
it's not safe for us. And because of the way that those key kind of figures within those organisations tend to position themselves in that kind of, I guess, white saviour uh, identity, when you call it, it's literally like you've crushed their soul rather than made constructive feedback. And it's very, very hard to navigate. And um, like I said, the level of ferocity you face when you do that is next level. Mm. And they will go at you or to, to almost absolutely destroy you, to discredit mm. something that challenges their, the identity they built for themselves. Yeah. And that's why like in leadership roles, you also have to look at retention, right? You yeah. can put somebody in a yeah. director role for a year, but if you're getting a new person of colour director every year, red flag. Yeah. Um, you, you have to be able to you have to be able to disagree and then yeah. come back from disagreeing and change it for the better. You can't just be like, oh, you don't fit my mould, so next. Yeah. Um, or, or speak over our experiences. Because mm. if we're telling you what we're experiencing, it's real, right? right? And it takes a lot for us to speak up on issues mm. that affect us because of how vulnerable it makes us, because of how we understand the systems mm. that we've always had to survive in. Mm. And yeah, it's, it's yeah. not good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to yeah, like speak on that with that vulnerability yeah. and the times where I reflect where I've had to speak out about something and like that in itself is such a, a big thing but then the emotional baggage afterwards of like me going through my head being oh no I'm like that person again I'm always the one that's bringing up the issues like consistently and like that has a really big like impact emotionally yeah. physically and mentally um, financially Financially, because the cost of calling out is job yeah. insecurity. Yeah. 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 Therefore, and then sometimes being put in the position of, okay, so I have had a lot of hostility, but I have had, when I brought things up, oh, okay, so now I want you to educate me and have it actually yeah. taken for on free. for free <laughs> yeah. within a space where I'm paying to be there to learn something, but end up <laughs> educating <laughs> and sitting everyone down. Um, yeah. And then having that, you know, that's something. Really acknowledge that mm -hmm. I have a right to be here too, and that, that detracts yeah. and takes away from what I'm doing. Mm. It detracts from your authenticity as well, and how you identify because you have this identity projected onto you that isn't mm. yours to own. I'm not educator. Mm. You know? Yeah. I mean, I happen to be educator, so <laughs> you, should <laughs> you should be allowed to do it when you want to. That's do it. That's right. right. There should be a choice in that, yes. rather it be a just a unspoken expectation of existing in any space mm. and that links into that there is always the cost of existing in white space unfortunately and the cost is compromise on our part always sure it's you know jump on board with what we want don't question it because if you do you feel the force of that mm. so it's it's never easy and it, it can have a lasting impact on your career because then you can get demonized or like oh they're a troublemaker yeah. and yeah. like they just spoke up. Like, mm. yeah, I've met people who have had reputations, and then I've been like, I've worked with them, and been like, they're not even, mm. yeah, what are you talking about? Mm. They're just being transparent. Yeah. And they're not being antagonistic or yelling. Like, sometimes people can take criticism way too personally, and it's just, I guess it's like a tennis match. You don't, you know, you just lobby to each other, and you, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's just, I don't like the, the angry. Yeah. Definitely. I think it's interesting as well, like, um, what's been said, like, about, um, yeah, trying to navigate spaces and bringing up, um, you know, things that would make this more of, firstly, a culturally safe space, which is a bare minimum, because um, I feel like a cultural safety is an entry in or safety for the people in the workplace mm. is a bare minimum and so once you have that foundation you can go to cultural celebration and rather than cultural consumerism mm. um, and a lot of spaces I think that's why this group and finding people that you can cre create um, and share opportunities with and also inform each other, hey, there is this opportunity coming up in this space, um, and they're a safe space, and mm. we, and you feel like, you know, you can go in there and 
you can trust them, you know, and having being able to have each other's back in that way mm. is so important. Um, but yeah, I think um, something that I find difficult sometimes is, yeah, the um, kind of, uh, um, I guess, tunnel vision of specific things that you're meant to create or specific things that you're meant to be. Considering, in my case, you're an Aboriginal artist, why don't you do dot painting? Um, and, or, you know, like, why, we have an expectation over um, if you are creating Aboriginal art, there needs to be an Aboriginal element. It's not just because you're an Aboriginal person making art. Um, and also, yeah, the expectation of, um, yeah, uh, that your art is to be, your culture is to be consumed, but maybe you're not meant to be um, a bum on a seat getting a salary, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's the real, um, like, minstrelism of people of colour where, mm. you know, you'll listen to our music, you'll watch us on movies, you'll watch us play sport, um, but our actual, like, systemic ideas are taken on board because they're not on show. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, to what you were saying about, you know, your art is Aboriginal art by virtue of you being Aboriginal. It's like just like when people say you don't look Filipino. It's like, well, yes, I do because I am. Yeah. And so <laughs> I don't really like. It's not like you don't look like a Sarah. Like that's a different thing. You know what I mean? like, so yeah, it's just it's like what? <laughs> so. It's that again. It's to do with objectification. Mm. And unfortunately, white space wanting to have ownership on our identities, mm. and that is. In constant, we are in constant resistance to that with regard to showing us authentically ourselves because we are constantly assumed to be, you must perform this, you must do that. And it's very hard, yeah. very hard to show up in absolute authenticity mm. because we're constantly fighting this resistance at, at every angle, mm. which is yeah, exactly and it's what also what people point to by saying, we're not racist, look at this. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. <"Yay."> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're other from the get-go, like, you know, you apply for a job and, you know, if you saw my name, Yasin in Sabunju, which is a shortened version of my last name, which is Sabunju Orlu, but good luck trying to get pronunciation of Sabunju Orlu. In, you know what I mean? Like, mm. my brother actually changed his name. So I won't go into it. But, yeah, he wasn't getting job interviews. And lo and behold, he changed his name. And that week he got 100 job interviews in retail. Like, mm. it's just mm. unbelievable, like, that you're already othered based on your name. and. The amount of times I've heard, oh no, where are you really from? And I'm like, no, I was born here. And mm -hmm. even if I wasn't, it doesn't matter. Like, yeah, like. Yeah, pick a more interesting question. <laughs> yeah, like, or, no, you seem like you have a good cultural background. What is it? That would be more interesting to me if someone said that to me. Like, But again, it's that open game, isn't it, that people think they can ask you those questions. They wouldn't ask anyone else that mm. because it's invasive. You know, it's, it's mm. just that. It's like the normal social rules of social navigation mm. are loose. Yes, because it's again, we're not seen in our full human self, mm. we're objects mm. for consumption, consumption of whiteness. Yeah. yeah, always. Mm. Mm. And, and it, that is, I think, quite confronting, probably for white folk to sit with, but there is an element of that in most, I would say, like consumerism. We, we're there to eat. Mm. Yeah, it's systemic, unfortunately, yeah. and ancestral. And built into DNA almost, like it's just, it's really hard to unpack all of the centuries of structure that's created it. Yeah, yeah. and I feel like, sorry, sorry. go, go for it. Okay, so <laughs> adding up to like, you know, what you're talking about, about the original art and stuff. Funnily, on the other hand, if you are someone with color and you're trying to make, like every now and then, you might want to work, make work that's not about our identity and cultural background and stuff, but because you're someone with color, you have your own nationality, of Australian like, nationality, um, you make a work, you put it out there, and say, oh, so this must be related to your pathetic childhood, um, <laughs> 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 whatever yeah. it is, you yeah. must have yeah. like, traumatized through this, that. I was like, no, yeah. I was just trying yeah. to make something about global warming. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Where's like, the drama form? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where's the racial trauma? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so true. So, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it's, it's, you never really get, it's uh, either on the like one side, like, like you're mm. saying about 
you want to make something out of the box, but then on the other hand, you're like always, people always see you in the box like that. Oh, you suffer from trauma, you trauma for something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I agree. And that, we were saying before as well, that's really inescapable at every level mm. within the arts community, I guess, even from inception at art school where our work is critiqued through white gaze, through a white lens, through white levelling, through white marking. Everything is projected through something that doesn't culturally fit for us. And so our work yeah. has to subscribe to things that are not authentic to us or our journey or our story. Mm. And it becomes so compromising and problematic. And, and it's, yeah, the authenticity is a constant battle because of that. Mm. You know, and we, if you want to be successful, if you want to earn money, you have to, you have to almost, well, sell out to it, because mm. otherwise, how can you survive in constant mm. resistance to something where the things that you produce are not seen as valid? Yeah, or palatable. Or palatable. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, yeah, it was kind of, you know, yeah, extending on that, um, the word trauma porn, mm -hmm. and yeah, having just, graduated from an arts degree I found like within that when it came to researching one just trying to find and identify people who were like people of color queer and it wasn't trauma porn that process was so traumatizing within myself because mm -hmm. everything you saw was just trauma 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 like mm -hmm. here it is and it was almost like inescapable mm -hmm. um, like you know that comes also I was lucky enough during my MA to do a module at Tate Modern in the UK um, and it was actually an education for cultural language and identity, I didn't quite finish it, never mind, but um, the module at Tate Modern was looking at the white cube and we actually looked at curatorship, which is also hugely problematic because rarely do we as artists of colour get to create the broader story that our work is presented in. Again, it's usually dominated by white gaze and a, and a retelling or restructuring the story that often conflicts grossly with our narrative or where we place it or like Alice was saying our work gets these projections onto them that aren't there um, and so that's also interesting and I, I think something I guess I would like to see in the future is more discussions around that and the decolonisation of curatorship in that sense as well. Yeah and that's and bringing it back to Takari's show like it would be great if it was a norm for POC artists to have a collective to, yeah. you know, help us voice things that we haven't put together as well yet. Or yeah. if we don't feel like crying in front of people all the time. You yeah. know what I mean? Sometimes, like, you, you find um, comfort and trust in your peers, and that's how our ancestors did, and mm -hmm. we're refinding that now. Um, and what you were saying about art school as well, um, mm -hmm. I feel like for all of us, um, our parents never let art be a valid choice, mm -hmm. so there just aren't as many lecturers um, in these art courses because historically we just that wasn't a viable option. Um, and so when we look for mentors, we're peer mentors because we're going through it together mm -hmm. because our parents don't speak up about it, even if they are incredible artists. My mom is a baker, she's a sewer, she gardens for days, but you know, her practice is architecture and that's all that she talks about mm -hmm. with other people. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really valid. Like I feel like um, leading up to the show and um, doing this collective and being able to bring people together, I feel like is really um, it's a bit an interesting um, contradiction in my mind working towards a, a solo show um, when I feel like I it, to me like this is that the anti solo show <laughs> and like I feel like yeah like there's some some great works of mine on there up there that people can look to but it's also like um, individualized success is very um, white and mm -hmm. very like I feel like our it's false. Like, exactly it's and I feel like, no. <laughs> yeah exactly and it's like you can't get to where you got to without people and we're just not going to acknowledge that mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel like a lot of people have asked like why did you start 
the collective, like what was the impetus for that. And I was like, you know, I went to art school, didn't really learn about people that were like me. You know, I'd been navigating the arts for a few years, um, the industry, and you know, I'm missing my people. You know, I need people that I can support, Skillshare, and like support me, because ultimately it's like hard as hell out here, you know? That's mm. re the reality. Um, and, but I also feel like we can actually support each other without being like, oh no, I can't tell you about this opportunity because then mm. you become my competition. Mm. Um, and I feel like there is an element of that in the Adelaide art scene because it, it's so small. Mm. It feels like, oh yeah, there is that, one um, uh, culturally inclusive studio at the mill, like how many people do I have to like fight to get it, you know? Whereas it's like, now it's like, oh, well, let's all just go down the line, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And of course, that, you know, the, that's an inspired <laughs> novel of living in systems that don't make for white supremacy. Yeah. It pits us against each other in, mm. all, in all areas. Yeah. And so, yeah. Our collectivity together is an act of resistance of that, but also something that is so inherent and part of most of our cultures. And mm -hmm. again, it's something that I have great gripe with the way that whiteness is commodifying um, collectivism. Yes. Well, it, I think the key difference is like we're not, not now anyway, we're not immediately trying to make it an organisation. We're not immediately trying to make it a not for profit. We're just people who want to meet up and talk about the stresses in our lives mm -hmm. and see the common themes through all of our different disciplines and just, you know, not be out here alone, like Takari said. Um, mm -hmm. Like, you know, catch me a year ago, I would have never thought I would be like working alongside you because we've just had such different like avenues and you as well, Percy, like yeah. it's just, it's, it's yeah. doesn't make sense that we cross paths what we did and that's yeah. kind of culture, I guess. Yeah. Um, I found the group through Instagram from a friend, and if that hasn't happened, like, mm. yeah, there's power in social media and community, mm. but because I'm an older person, like, I'm in my 40s, like, in Adelaide is very different, and so for me, like, most of my friends were white, most of my colleagues were white, like, I didn't really know any other artists that were doing, like, artwork, and so when I found this collective, I was just, oh my god, what, like, what a breath of fresh air, because I felt, I didn't realise you can get used to something, like yeah. how much I needed this group, and mm -hmm. how hard it's been, yeah. and how much I've internalised a lot of stuff, you know, being an artist, being a filmmaker or whatever, and yeah, yeah like even like when I was 23, like I did my honours in the Middle Eastern representation of women through Western eyes post-September 11, because September 11 completely obliterated being a Muslim woman, which I am, and Turkish, and I just was sick of those par paradigms, and I wish I had a group like this, because, you know, being Muslim and Turkish, I am an outsider, and I am kind of, some people are like, oh, she's naughty, or she's bad, or whatever, but, yeah, I felt like an outsider to both the East and the West, mm. so for me, like, I love that we're all different backgrounds, but we all have that shared collective of lived experiences of I guess being othered or... Mm -hmm. like yeah, or not fitting the stereotype, but also not wanting to fit the stereotype. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's like, yeah, to build on that, I feel like we've had lots of conversations around um, how important this group is, because even talking within our families, the mm -hmm. intergenerational um, survival has been so different, mm -hmm. like between parents kind of taking the approach of you know not rocking the boat to now us uh, you know obviously they have paved the way for us to be able to come in and be like uh, the bare minimum is not enough mm -hmm. um, yeah. and to but also to like have these chats and be like light the fire up each of our asses to mm -hmm. be like go back to our individual kind of roles within society and be like, actually, the crumbs you're feeding us isn't a full meal, mm. yeah. you know? Yeah, it's yeah. just like where racism was for our parents versus where racism is for us. Yeah. Like, what Takari was saying is like, my mum 
would go to work and you know she would be told by her boss that you know she can't go to the bathroom during her shift or take personal phone calls despite being like an architect in an office mm. and not this isn't like a retail job where you just have to stand in one spot the whole time um and so mum's frontier was like bare minimum respect i'm going to the toilet when i want and i'm answering the phone when my kid calls yeah. but then she stayed at that place for 20 30 years um, and she was like, look, if you just get on their side and put your head down and get the work done, they'll start to respect you. And that was true for her generation. That's not, I'm not trying to invalidate that, but now that she's paved that, I want to hit that and then push it further. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you can, I, I will try my best to, you know, get along in this workplace, but also, um, there's new crumbs. <laughs> and also, <laughs> yeah. that conflicts with this sense of showing up authentically. Yeah. yeah. Respectability politics is a is a poison chalice because if we do subscribe to it like our parents have and had to, mm. yeah, then it's the same shit again and again and again. Yeah. And you know, we sh why should we be held to standards that we don't believe in mm. anyway? You yeah. know, and the, the minute the problem with respectability politics is the moment you step your foot out of line, mm. you're invited. Yeah. yeah. And sure. so that is, I guess, what a lot of our conversations have, have centred around about our ability to be authentic with our resistance as mm. best we can yeah. Yeah. whilst staying as safe as we can yeah. because the two are not, they don't, they don't work together. Yeah, it's very much a contradiction because it's yeah. like how can you still put food on the table, how can you still pay rent, yeah. but also be like, hey, I don't feel safe right now. Yeah. And hey, we ultimately, we all want the same thing. We all want things to be better for everyone. Yeah. But it's that uh, historical disconnect and um, yeah, I think this is a very good moment. Yeah. I'm not very good at a segue, but that's what it's going to do. Um, we have a quote, we don't know who it's from, we don't really care. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you can attribute it on the internet. Yeah, I know. It's, it's fine. Easy. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, I mean, it probably does, but it's fine. Uh, Yasmin um, brought this quote to us last night when we were having a chat, um, which was, and I think, yeah, everyone just take this in. Um, we're going to have some comments about this. Um, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And I think that is the classic trope of why is this insert whatever culture you'd like here getting um like getting special treatment. Why do Aboriginal people get housing? Why do Aboriginal people get free cars and money? It's like I you know, I don't have free cars and money. I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be helpful. <laughs> this rental crisis. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it, I think as soon as we get a chance, I feel like people get they get itchy feet to be like, no, nope, where's mine? Yeah. Mm. You know, and it's just when it's just a. I think it's just. I think we're often trying to. Um, uh, justify um, just trying to be at the same level, you know, or just trying to have the same opportunities, like changing your name, is just to get to the interview stage, yeah. you know? And it's like, well, what is it, what is it like for your brother once they see him, you know? Not that great. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and it's like, well, yeah. And I have the opposite of your brother because I've probably got the most white sounding name ever, Kirsty Rutherford. I mean, you get more Scottish sounding than that. So I walk in, I get in, and it's like, oh, now we don't know what to do. Yeah. Especially when I'm unapologetic in the way I present as well, and it's like, oh, no one quite knows what to do. Yeah, yeah, they can't back yeah. down. Yeah. yeah, but it's interesting also, like in queer spaces, like my brother, mm. he's gonna hate me. Yeah, like I mean, it's a well-known fact that there is racism in queer spaces, mm. like big time, Whoa. especially. Yeah, like he's shown me profiles where there's said stuff like no curry munches, no this, no that, like, and it's just like, yeah, yeah his sure. dating life is pretty wow. not that great. Yeah. It's, funny, it's a joke when people say that Australia is not racist. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? And with these, yeah. like, there are 
very blatant ones like yeah, this, yeah, and then there, then there are the systemic ones like you're talking about. And and um, when you try to point out like systemic racism at an organization, mm. the person you are sharing that with takes it personally. And it's like, I literally said systemic racism, mm. but mm. racism is just all they hear, and then they see red, and then they want to remove the problem because it's such visceral anxiety. Yeah. And the blessing and curse of our lives is we live with visceral anxiety. So that's not new when that happens. Um, yeah. But it is so new for them. So it's like, yeah, I just Relax. I just want out of this conversation, yeah, 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 and yeah, I want yeah. to not think about it, and I want to gaslight myself, and, and pretend I want to that's make you go away. Yeah, because yeah. you've done this to me. Yeah, because but, yeah. if I go away, or if you go away, and there's no then more there's problem. no more systemic racism. Yeah, um, exactly. And then the next person's too scared to speak up, so then they think it's absolved. So. Yeah. What do you do? <laughs> Definitely. If someone points out a problem, like one of the problem is done, it's like, oh, we we'll just get rid of the person who we'll takes to speak it out, so there's no more problem. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, what we were just talking about as well about other spaces uh, where you know other marginalised groups often absolve themselves of being able to perpetrate racialised harm because I think there is that. It, it, implied belief, and it's misguided, that just because you occupy an identity that's marginalised, you know how it feels, and of course you would never do that. Yeah. And it actually can make some spaces, yeah. particularly queer spaces, particularly dangerous for people of colour because of that self-absolution from being, having any capacity to commit harm. Mm. And it's yeah. like some things I've heard in such spaces have been the worst. Mm. Um, yeah. Or the most subtle types of racism, but so apparent, mm. apparently subtle, yet the, the capacity to take ownership of that has just been, you know, yeah, yeah. I got, yeah, I got racially profiled. I won't say what store, and they were following me around. This white guy, and he was making it very obvious from the get-go he didn't want me in the store. And then when I tried some clothes on, and then I like left, he said something really weird. I can't remember. But I just normally would have let it go, and I said something like, yeah, I think that was a bit of a racist comment, and he fucking was like, but I'm gay, I can't be racist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just because yeah, queerness is also an oppressed group of people mm. doesn't mean when I work, walk into a queer space I feel safe. Yeah. yeah. You know? Totally. And doesn't mean that I'm not still at risk. Mm. And like I think, yeah, that's the thing as well. And that's what like I feel like coming together has been really good and like hopefully it's a message of this exhibition is that like yeah, like us our individual, our individual identities are not a monolith. Like no. we, like you know, just because there's like the guy at the shop that's like a white gay man, yeah. it's like okay, that's great. But there's definitely more <laughs> layers to that to identity, and there can be a million layers. Mm. But I feel like oftentimes it's like you can only occupy one box yeah. at a time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> and that's, um, that's something that's really, I think, hard for white folk to get. I've been in a lot of white feminist spaces, and I think the point that fails every time to get across is, I'm a black woman, I'm never a woman in isolation, I'm never black in isolation. Mm -hmm. And those two identities are inexplicit. It, I can't break them up, I can't separate them. I do not know what it's like to exist black and I do not know what it is like to exist as a woman. I only know the world as black woman. Mm -hmm. and so my racial and gender experience of the world are not separable. Mm. Which is yeah, just, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, you know, and so it's you mm. know, you, you can't experience queerness if you're a person of colour without the colour lens on it because you Yeah, definitely. Because and we I, can't compartmentalise our multiple identities. It's part of and I think that was clear in some of your work as well. Yes, yes. Real bind that that gets projected on us, especially as people of colour, to only be one thing. Mm. 
and there's this fight, there's this internal fight to, to, to help her. Anyway, sorry. No. <laughs> I talk about your work. <laughs> no, your no, work, no, you know, no, no. I felt that back in a lot of the. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm glad. Um, yeah, no, that's definitely hitting the nail on the head. Like, I feel like that's the thing is that um, I think as well is like, as we're talking about um, progressive spaces and like, ultimately we do want authentically progressive spaces. Yeah, for sure. And um, I will make one last comment and then I'll do like an ultimate question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like, it's, it's a, it's a good-ish note, so, you know, that's all we can do. Um, but, um, yeah, I feel like, um, okay, I've just forgotten it, but, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that, oh, that's what I was going to say. I think that we forget if we're going to create an accessible space, that accessibility isn't a pick and choose. Yeah. It's an umbrella term for, okay, like, what does physical, physical needs accessibility mean? And, like, Sorry. Where, how can you learn up on that? Mm. And, like, okay, if you're people of colour or um, ling linguistically inclusive, like, you know, you can't just pick and choose. And I think there are um, a lot of spaces that mm. are so ready to add that label. And it's like, oh, I want you to add that label too. Like, don't get me wrong, but like, don't prematurely label it yeah. if I'm gonna bring my friend and it's not physically accessible for them, but mm. we've spouted that. Yeah. yeah for sure. Or um, it's not culturally safe for, you know, my lovely Turkish friend. Like, you know, yeah. um, it, it's like some groups get to pick and choose mm. and others just rock up and they're like, oh, well, I've turned away again. Mm. And, and it's also like, what, what you were saying to we really do want authentically progressive spaces, mm -hmm. it's like that critique is not to say your shit, yeah. you know what I mean? It's just a critique. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean you're not doing enough, so stop doing it completely. And I feel like that is the knee-jerk reaction, is like, you critique me, so I'm just going to take it away. Too hard. Um, too yeah, hard. yeah, too hard, or so um, too much hard. money, or it takes too long, or yeah. I don't know. Or, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, the, oh, we're already doing so much. Yeah, and it's yeah. like it, it, an authentically yeah. progressive and inclusive space will just have that lens. And I think it's um, Maya Angelou, maybe, who says it's like, do the best with what you can with what you know, and once you know better, do better. Yeah, yeah. I bastardize that, but that's just what it is, and that's how you have to be okay. That's what a progressive movement should be, is like, we're doing the best we can, but once I have this new information, I'm going to do better even more so. Um, but don't burn the hand that's willing to feed you the information and knowledge to do better. Mm. Take mm. it and see it as a gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and we talk a lot about anger in our meetings and how we are so viscerally angry but then nobody listens to us when we're angry <laughs> or when we, or when we um, react or you know, spout something yeah. mm. even though it's valid for us to be angry. So yeah, because it sucks. But you have to. <laughs> yeah. But then you have to like add an a, a, a filter of palatability, or um, yeah, come to this meeting heavily unpack it to be mm. able to hand it in a really nice package. Mm. To yeah. then be yeah, to have that whole cycle run again. But it again comes into that unwillingness to accept our full humanity. Mm. It has to be tempered every time mm. in order yeah. to be received. Yeah, yeah, big time. Um, I guess another question. Well, I don't know. Last question. Oh, I don't know. Sorry, I'm Sorry. Try I'm trying to be good. Can listen it's twenty minutes. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Last question, and then are you guys happy to take questions from the audience? Sure. Yeah, but if it's inappropriate, I'm not. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, or, or not right, not the take. Um, <laughs> stand for it. Um, so, basically, we've been talking about where things fall apart and where things, yeah, how angry we are. Because we are, and it's, <laughs> it's, 
valid. Yeah, this laughter is a trauma response. I'm not really laughing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, I feel like uh, I think I'd like to pose like the dream kind of future, if you will. What would like why kind of uh, things like this if if we could have the feeling that we have when we're together and we're talking and we're listening to each other if we could have that in spaces where there are a handful of more white people in there um, what would make it better what can our say we're just talking to all the CEOs of the world right now <laughs> on the live stream and they're just like mm, give it to me um, and they're listening <laughs> Um, yeah, what would we say? Uh, in, like, utopian, it would be, like, yeah. not to dream of labour. Like, I would like, if I want to create, I would like to just create. Yeah. I don't mm. want there to be, I don't know, like, um, like, perceived outcomes before I've made the thing, because sometimes making the thing turns into something else. Yeah. Um, and like consumerism, consumerism caveats. Yeah. And stuff. It's yeah. Like. And also just um, utopia, not there not be this like scarcity um, mm. Mm. where we're pretending that there's only a finite amount of positions for us. We don't want to compete against each other. We want to see us all thrive. Solidarity is mutual liberation, right? Um, so I want to see us all do well. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. want to see us in positions. Power, like yeah. where we're not just like yeah like the flavor or you know mm. I was going to say something which would have been a bit controversial but yeah like I guess just taking like where we can have an impact and we're not the token mm. person taking up space because yeah. they have to mm. yeah there's somebody that's probably quite forcefully tried to push change and that's my modus operandi if you like for me a utopia I'm a bird of that and I don't feel that um, weight on my back to do that. Mm -hmm. I do that on the behalf of somebody that probably falls into the older category. Um, <laughs> I've gone past the point of pushing up, mm. and delivering everything politely, and I don't. And there are costs to that and burdens. Mm. The part of the burden, which is, I guess, I don't think it's self imposed, is that I feel I need to do that for the younger people to see. But my utopia, there's no requirement for me to do that, and I'm free. Yeah. Yeah. And that freedom is, again, something that I don't think I'll ever experience in my, my lifetime, but it is, you know, in that concept of what is white privilege, that is what a white privilege is, but you do not know what it's like to have to navigate, navigate every space with this burden, this self-checking, yeah. this I need to push this, like, you know, yeah, yeah, it's, it's that release. That's yeah. it. And just, like, rocking up to your your job and just doing your job without being like oh I need to do th this plus I need to make this a safe space yeah. not even for yourself mm. for the people that will come after you once you burn mm. out yeah. and I suppose the best that can be felt by whiteness is ignorance mm. oh I don't, oh, I don't think racism exists I don't know any of this happens that's the bliss of ignorance that we never, ever, ever have the privilege of enjoying, you know, mm. from knee, knee high, whether that's in that conversation with your parents explaining to you the world isn't that. Mm. However, but that burden, that freedom of your ignorance is something I will never know, and I'll probably only feel that as the kiss of my final breath comes out of my body as I leave, you know, mm. which is really, really sad. Mm. And I don't want that. I just want to Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't. I watched a really uh, interesting documentary um, by I think it was Yatasha. Oh my God. Womack. Yatasha Womack. I, um, I think I know. Yeah. Um, on this Afro future, which is amazing. Yeah. Definitely check it She's out. She's done a few good things. She has done some great things. But mm -hmm. just in this, like, on this conversation of the future and utopia, I felt was. To bring into this conversation was when you ask people of colour or people that have been marginalised what the future looks like, what utopia looks like, you get very different responses. Like mm -hmm. in that sense of like, you know, in I guess the world of whiteness, you know, like utopia or the future looks like flying cars or you know scientific mm. um, 
you know, exploration expansion, whereas, you know, for a lot of other people it's just, you know, just living in a world where there's no prejudice and racism and you're not, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel you. And I think that's the, like, uh, innocence and glorification of having those kind of conversations and being like, oh, if you could live in another time, when would you live? And it's like, mm, when was a time when we weren't being killed? <laughs> None of them. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, yeah, when's, when's the utopia gonna, like, be the, or when is the time when we're not gonna be racially discriminated against or killed? Mm. Or rah, rah, rah. And it's like, we're still waiting for that time. Mm. You know? And it's interesting, like, words like the Anthropocene or, you know, dystopia, because for a lot of us, we're already, we've mm. lived those centuries ago. We've had our cultures destroyed or, you know, mm. religious beliefs destroyed. And, yeah, like, a lot of us have already had that. And now yeah. it's, the rest of the world is experiencing that, either through climate change or polit politics. Yeah. And if you look at it in a literary sense, I don't know if any of you have read I think it's the fables by Octavia Butler, which are dystopian tales she wrote 30 years ago. Mm. It's now. Oh, yeah. Mm. Everything that, she's a black writer, and everything that she wrote about is is happening now. She predicted a Trump. She predicted this would be, and it, it, it's exactly as it is. Mm. You know? mm. Yeah. And to bounce off what you were saying about the, like, Afrofuturism, is that what you said? Like, mm. not being able to imagine that is so sad. Like, yeah. this this necessity for basic needs takes away our capacity to imagine and to yeah. be more creative, bringing it back to art. Like, um, because survival so consumed. Yeah, I would love to imagine and I would love to, you know, think of Utopia as flying cars and, mm -hmm. uh, like, no global warming. You know what I mean? Like it would be just so nice, but we're we're literally advocating for. Hey, can I disagree with you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or yeah, or can we just live? Like mm. because I have a disability, and so many black women, especially, die like unnecessarily through the medical system yeah. or through mm. social funding. And I'm just like, mm. for me, I just want to be taken seriously by doctors. Black women are not medicated as much. They're not given like pain medication. They die in labor. Like it's just unbelievable. And I'm white passing as hell, but it's still like I've experienced so much medical racism that it's just like I've had doctors flat out say, "Oh, it's because you're from the Mediterranean that you're maybe histrionic." And I'm like, "What?" And the, or you're eccentric. Oh, I just thought you were weird because you were from Turkey. And I'm just like, "What?" Like a white male. so much of my energy is consumed with battling the bigger picture because mm. I feel that burden. And I should be allowed to feel joy, and joy is an act of resistance. But also I don't want to live in eternal joy mm. because I don't want to live in the polar of what I'm supposed to live in, which is misery, yeah. just because. Mm. And so imagine, imagine even having to debate the concept of joy within mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah. And it's 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 it's, 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 it's and that dialogue that we have oh, about yeah, it sure. is 
is so telling of the space that we occupy. And we're, also, you know, and we're also, yeah. neither of us are wrong. Like, yes, no, Kirstie, no, no. Kirstie and I will have opposing opinions on joy and justice. Yeah. Um, but then at the end of it, we see each other's perspectives. Yeah. And then Kirsty will say, anyway, don't you wish white people thought this hard about this? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yes, I do. Yeah. That would make it better. Yeah. I don't want to be fighting you ever. Yeah, and we're not yeah, really no, fighting. We're, we're just disagreeing healthily. And that's yeah, a conversation. Yeah. And then debates about, about it. But the fact that debate power and joy yeah. is something that I honestly don't believe. Mm. I think it's exclusive to, to people of colour. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But also there's sometimes like, I wouldn't say stigma, but if you're like really happy go lucky and like live a carefree life, sometimes people are like, Well, are you an activist so you're doing this? And it's sometimes just existing is an act of resistance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Or yeah. well, like, like rest is resistance, right? Yeah. If you like, don't yeah. fuel capitalism and you rest, mm. then you're mm. slowing down a process that's not feeding you anyway. So yeah. 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 like the NAP ministry, look them up. Mm. Yeah, I love that oh, I just saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I think, was that the thing, wait, at MoMA? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I think is that, so. I think so, yeah, like, group of artists like that what? were, yeah, you like naps as an act of resistance, and mm. just, like, bought all their pillows, yeah. and, like, sleeping under... She just released a book, and she, yeah. like, oh. you, you shouldn't quantify this, but she's also has a PhD, and has, yeah. you know, gone through the ropes. It shouldn't quantify it, but yeah. it's like, this person who's gone through the system is a person of colour, and mm. has done all the things, is saying, rest. Like, mm. yeah. Like from what I read, like in that small article, was you know she was saying that people of color have a significantly less amount of sleep, um, you know, and how that feeds into, uh, what should I say, like how that how that lack of sleep filters into many things, and one of them being the ability to dream, and, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, and that being such a fertile space. Mm, um, sure. Yeah. Um, should we? Does anyone have a question? Is anyone brave enough to have a question? <laughs> Sorry, I just might rephrase it. And I believe you can, if you're online, montage? There's no question. Okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever CEOs. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I just want to say, I forget the quote, and I really like it, and this can apply to not just racism, but everything. Yeah. Like, none of us are free. Like, what is that? Oh, she's free until we're There is free? no woman yeah. free until. Every woman has free from the shackles or whatever, mm. something like that. Yeah, mm. which is, a, I've ruined that, but yes. <laughs> I am not free until every woman is free. Yeah. 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 yeah, I just, like, we're not just doing it for ourselves because our freedom is your freedom. Because yeah. Don't you want to live in a world where everyone's free? Mm. Yeah. And the answer is no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But, yeah, but that's our goal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We don't think you work for free for us. If you're free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. But all society's going to collapse, but there's a good new bank, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, just take your ticket. Yeah. <laughs> Great show. Just, check it out. Oh, just to quickly circle to the Solidarity Collective, um, I feel like, you know, just having that space where we all kind of hold and support and rejuvenate lift each other like when one of us succeeds like we all succeed like we're yeah. all there like backing each other up like mm. it's not that, yeah. you know like oh, they got the thing mm. yeah you know it's yeah. like no like yes they got it mm. like fuck yeah totally yeah. Yeah. no i feel you and i just feel like and i think it's like yeah the the success of the group is those moments of joy that we can take you know like, I feel like we can, in, I guess, ultimately, we're weaker apart, you know? And I think when we come together, we can, you know, warn each of other of culturally unsafe spaces. Mm. Or just, yeah, be like, you know, we're not going to wait for an arts organisation to win that grant that they've been trying to win to be able to create a space for culturally diverse people to come together. Mm. It's like, no, we're gonna come together ourselves. Yes. To create our own space. To create our own opportunities yeah, yeah, yeah. because we could be waiting a while. Yeah, we've got we don't know how long we could be waiting. Yeah. We don't necessarily need seats at tables because we've got our own tables. Yeah. yeah. We need them to be uplifted. And I, that leads me to another old quote, which I is, um, <laughs> you know, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Yeah. We need to create our own spaces with our own strategies in our own 
on our own terms. Right. And if people want to support us in that, it's mm -hmm. empower us to do that, not via other channels that have all these terms and conditions, right. unspoken terms and conditions attached to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, oh okay. What's next? She oh. asks. <laughs> <laughs> I think they did, that was a pretty much <laughs> maybe what's next. Sorry, Del. <laughs> oh, nice. Maybe we need to be a touring group. Yeah. 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 So I guess that. We could. You could have to go on tour having these conversations with different artists. Yeah. Artists and then you need to pay us well and give us all the yeah. 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 I think twisties. Yeah. I think yeah. um, twisties would be. Our, our, our energy has been like, it's not for lack of trying, but us trying to succeed in white spaces. We've tried. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like our energy has been, um, we'll come together, we'll, we'll, you do you, we'll do us, and then once we, as we build that power, mm -hmm. other people will be like, oh shit, what are they doing over there? You know yeah. what I mean? Because, mm -hmm. yeah. like, when you're fighting in one, when you're fighting the systemic pressures of one organisation, you're fighting to fix one organisation. Mm -hmm. um, but when we're living in our joy, um, it can radiate, right? And yeah. that's the hope anyway. And yes, there's pain, yes, there's frustration, yes, there's talk about white-led diversity and inclusion trainings. Um, but the <laughs> common experience of that lets us relinquish it and then bring joy in each other. Because mm, yeah. when you're going through it, you feel like you're the first person to go through it, right? Um, so you just need to have that one conversation to be like, oh, oh shit, like I'm not and so, and then yeah. that frees up the brain space for the joy, hopefully. So basically what That's Denise it. is asking for, if anybody would like to give us funding, <laughs> to, to basically pay for a space resort to exist in our piece and create, we're not yeah, going to say anything. Also, yeah. 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 Mm. yeah, no, I think, um, I think that's the interesting thing as well, is that I think coming to the um, climax of the coming together of the exhibition, there was a lot of questions in, from my lovely people on these seats, but also externally of what's going to happen to the collective. Yeah. And it's like, oh no, I still need the support. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, I still need, I still want to thrive within this community. Yeah. And you know, yes, we did, with the lovely help of the people from the mill, get a grant for this opportunity to initially bring us together, mm. but just because we don't have a grant following that up doesn't mean that this support stops. Yeah. And I think that um, for us going forward, I think it's, you know, it's coming to the end of your work day, being so drained by fighting the fight, feeling like you just want to fall in bed, but coming together and yeah. being like, and having those discussions and I feel like the rewards that we right. bring together mm -hmm. are so much greater than like the exhaustion that we face yeah. on a daily right. basis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's and like the kind of yeah. therapy that's not accessible to us because most therapists are also white. So you <laughs> that's the like, yeah. thing as well. I mean, we can all laugh, but you spend your entire therapy session explaining your oh, experience yeah. to your therapist well, ready for next session. Well, that was yeah. that was the thing as yeah. well as yeah. we came together and we're like um, these are our experiences and this is what it's like trying to explain to my the most amazing white therapist Jill um, <laughs> that I've been seeing for seven Shout years out to Jill. Um, about um, yeah how to work work through all of this but it's like you know there's there's so many levels of like you just we can't break through. Yeah. yeah. So now we're unpaid yeah. therapists for each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that also, you know, brings in, I'm not screening therapy anyway, I also have my amazing, lovely, white therapist. <laughs> 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 but also, it's all we've got. It's all we've got. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Because yeah. of the barriers too. But yeah. 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 Um, so just also how healing takes place in an isolated room mm. by yourself mm. in private yeah. um, is a very colonial, Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Whereas, you know, healing is just some way to expand another one of the many ways people can come together to facilitate mm. healing, connection, yeah. which, um, you know, is through like collectives like this. Totally. I agree. Making art. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess last night I was saying that I have used my talents not for evil.
legal, but for crypto companies in the past, and I'm like, yeah, like I would like to use those skills of fundraising mm. for things that are going to have an impact, and not just mm. some weird NFT collection that mm. is probably a scam for some. Mm. Or not. You know, like it's just yeah, I'm being really finicky at the moment with like I do want to feel like time is urgent at the moment, but I don't want to put pressure on the group. But it's like yeah, I just would love to see change, but also have spaces where we could maybe do a group yeah. therapy yeah. thing or play thing yeah. or you yeah. know, or even an outing where we're just having fun with that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Yeah. I love it. And I feel like yeah, like we all kind of are from dis different disciplines and we're all plugging away at things. But yeah, no sponsor us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give okay. us money. Maybe, maybe that's a moment for me to say thank you to Art South Australia. Love you, Art South Australia. <laughs> and also, um, probably more importantly, to the Mummy Button Foundation, oh, yeah. Yeah, who, who thank you. have supported our studio residency and continue to do so. And really, um, their whole remit is about having these conversations about culture and um, and being able to, to share. And um, so, thank you guys so much for being here tonight and sharing with us and making us feel uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and showing us ways that we can all grow. Um, I think that's really important and I'm glad that you guys have been able to experience like the full range of emotions in your meetings together. Um, what a lovely thing and yeah, I hope that you keep on building your own Mm. I just wanted to say you have a really strong voice together, really powerful, and I'm sure you've moved the rest of the room like I feel moved, and um, triggered some stuff from my cultural heritage and things that you know things that I don't think about mm. in my life that I've ignored and buried, mm. and like it made me feel like I want to come to your collective. <laughs> <laughs> but um, like you have a very strong voice as six amazing people and I think there are more of you that we haven't heard from tonight that yeah. we we mentioned the other night at your at the opening yeah. um, but thank you so much for, for and, and and thank you everyone in the room for um, our listening ear mm. and